upon the introduction of kingdoms a few thousand years before Jesus Christ came, uh, rulers in the kingdom realized that there were men who were devious and would give false messages to families, communities, towns in order for personal gain. And yet under the guise of being messengers of the king. Uh, remember, we're going back thousands of years and uh, the way uh, kingdoms would work, would, there would be messengers that would go from the courts of the king. They would go out on horses or, uh, or walking in our two communities carrying a message as heralds of the message of what was taking place and how communities should behave. Uh, but we know that uh, the hearts of men are desperately wicked uh, and uh, any opportunity for personal gain, uh, we know that outside of the Spirit of Christ, men would take that opportunity. And so what started to happen over, uh, over the generations of kingdoms is that kings would start to authenticate their message with a seal. And in came the introduction of seals. Uh, often it would be rings that kings would wear with an imprint, with a, a family emblem or something like that. And you may remember from movies or, or images that wax would be uh, heated up and dripped upon a, a, a closed letter, a closed envelope, and the king would seal it with his signet ring, a signing ring. Uh, and that would prove that the herald, it would prove that the message and the messenger were authenticated and real. And uh, the message that could be, that was about to be read out was legitimately from the king. And so it became instrumental, it became crucial, not instrumental, it became crucial that what uh, took place within communities is that the people would know their king's sign. So that as a herald came into their environment, as they checked the seal, uh, that they would know that it's not a fake. They would know that this is real. They would be able to protect themselves from counterfeits or people with selfish motives or imposters. That they would be able to know, okay, this is legitimate. This message we can read from the king. And so it was crucial that the king's seal uh, would be around in order to protect communities from counterfeit activity. If we do a quick search on just uh, uses of seals over the history, and it reveals some interesting words. It says this, a seal is a device for making an impression. The original purpose was to authenticate a document. Since prehistoric times, seals were used as proof of identity and authenticity. Or for marking property, one wanted to make sure one's rights over would be respected. And so we get words like impression and authenticate and proof of identity and marking property as one's own, all coming from this word, the seal. As we are in this series called Chief Dangers, uh, where this is the second to last one, as we've looked at a number of topics. But just to pull you back into the story, uh, a man called William Booth in uh, the 1890s was asked the question, what does he see as chief dangers to humanity going forward? And this was his response. The chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Spirit, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. And so what I want to take today is just this thought of the danger of us having a religion without the Holy Spirit. The danger of having a religion without the Holy Spirit. And so the first concept, just as I introduce this subject matter, is just understanding the King's seal. And our goal for today is this, to walk in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's the, the story I want to invite you into today over the next 20 minutes or so, just as we look at scriptures, as I tell a story or two, just that we would know that the Spirit of God, religion without the Holy Spirit is a danger to us. But with the Spirit of God, we are able to walk in His presence and in His power. And so I will kick us off with a scripture from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. And it says this, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. 
And so as we look at this and the king's seal marking you with a seal, marking you with a seal, Paul uses these words, the Ephesian church, we, were, we look at this, that the, the seal is for making an impression, for authenticating, for proof of identity, for marking property to ensure one's rights are upheld. And so I believe that the Holy Spirit in us and through us works all of these, uh, works all of these things into our worlds and they unfolds them as we go on this journey. And so after all, we need to know the King's seal upon us. We need to be marked by him. Otherwise, we open ourselves to all sorts of counterfeit work from imposters or even worse, from the enemy himself, from Satan. And so, as I've spoken, our goal today is to walk in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to be looking at three elements for us today. And the first is this, the Spirit of God, God with us. The Spirit of God, God with us. Uh, if you can read with me in Romans chapter 8, and it says this, However, you were not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. We talk much about God with us, Emmanuel, as Jesus, the resurrected King. Uh, we, we, we talk much about the glorified Jesus. We talk much about God in heaven, but uh, often we largely ignore God with us presently, the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so today we want to do that as we look at this Christ in you. Though our body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of Christ. John chapter 14 says this, the Spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him and he lives with you and will be in you. John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. What we see in these texts is that the spirit of Christ is with us, is in us and will be making a home with us. Friends, I want to help us understand today that uh, the Spirit of Christ is God with us. He is not one forgotten element of the triune Godhead. He is not distant. He is not God the Father in heaven. He is not Jesus who has been glorified. Jesus who was God with us as humanity, but not with us personally, because we never got to experience Jesus in person. But the Spirit of Christ is God with us now, in us, with us, making a home with us. Romans chapter 8 verses 13 and 14 says, For if we live according to the sinful nature, we will die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the misdeeds of the body, we will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. It is so crucial to our understanding that the Spirit of God is God with us today, is Emmanuel. As I look at many of our lives, I'm so thankful that we carry the mark of the Spirit, the impression of the Spirit, that the King's seal has been put upon us. But I also know that there are many who have believed in Jesus' work and yet consider the Holy Spirit as an optional extra in the deal or in the package. I want to encourage us with these words. Please do not accept Jesus' words. It is finished. When Jesus paid the price on the cross for our salvation, where he, uh, his death uh, allowed us to go free, when he said it is finished, we can receive salvation and the forgiveness of our sins. But he also said to us, it is better for you that I go, that I can send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit to you. We cannot be a people who accept the forgiveness uh, of our sins through it is finished and not the it is better for us if we are able to embrace the Spirit of God with us now. And so we've got to ask the question, how do we know if we are led by the Spirit? For most of us, we, we have faith in Jesus who died. We have faith in He who reigns in heaven, but we have little faith in Jesus who dwells in us by His Spirit. And so we want to know if we are sealed by the King, if we're marked by Him. Well, I think the answer to that question is, does your life increasingly show the impression of the life of Christ as worked out by the Spirit of Christ in you. 
And so, firstly, we need to know that the Spirit of God is God with us today. And in Jesus' words, He came for the forgiveness of our sin. It is finished. And that we may have life. It is better for you that I go and the Spirit of God come. And so, we're going to look just secondly at what is the mark of the Spirit of God. How do we know if His impression has been upon us? What is His work in us? Because I think sometimes we have such a limited view of who the Spirit of God is and what His primary work is, as though He should be working for us as opposed to glorifying God. And so we're going to just look at what His roles are. Uh, and so as we, we go, this is uh, just, just recapping, that is why he wants to make an impression on us in order to authenticate us, identify us and mark us as rightfully his. And so the first thing we see, just a mark of the spirit, how do we know if the impression, the seal of the king is upon us? Well, the primary work is to reveal Jesus. In John chapter 16, 13 and 14, it says this, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Making it known to you. This, these are the words from Jesus as He introduces the work and the person of the Spirit of of God. And what we see here is that the emphasis Jesus placed on the Holy Spirit was that of revealing Jesus to the world. And this is crucially important for us, that the primary work of the Spirit of God is to, re to reveal Jesus, to bring glory to Jesus. And that must change some of our views of the Holy Spirit's work in us. Uh, His work is not primarily to do miracles for us as though God is in submission to us. No, He's here to reveal truth. He is the Spirit of of truth first and foremost before he carries the life of God as the spirit of the miraculous. Number two, the mark of the spirit in us is to transform us. Romans chapter 2 verse 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so how do we do that? Well, 1 Corinthians 2, the, 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 the passage is 10 to 14, but I'm just going to highlight in the middle here. It says, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. And so uh, a second role of the spirit of God, how do we know if uh, the spirit of God is at work in us, that we've been sealed by him, his mark is on us? Well, are we busy transforming? Are we moving in obedience as we follow Jesus? I think the mark of the Spirit of God, the work of the Spirit of God in us is to transform our thinking, to renew our minds, that we would be obedient not to the patterns of this world, but to the patterns of God. And so to transform us. So what we see is first to reveal Jesus, second to transform us, third to proclaim Jesus. To proclaim Jesus, we see in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, and Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and if we carry on reading that passage, what we see is a whole bunch of people get saved as, as the Spirit of God sits upon the word that Peter preaches as he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if you have been marked by the Spirit of God, there is a proclamation of the glory of Jesus. There is a proclamation of the salvation power of Jesus, which comes for us. That is the impression, the mark, the authentication of the Spirit of God at work in us. Number four, we see to move in power, to move in power. This is where some of us might get excited around the miraculous, etc. But I, I've mentioned all these other things because it's important for us to know that the spirit of Christ is to reveal Jesus and to bring him glory. And so forth, we to move in power. And there's a number of ways that he does this. First, the miracle of salvation. We read in Romans 8, 17, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, salvation. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And so as he moves in power, it's for the miracle of salvation. Second, it's for the miracle of tongues. We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and uh, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
May I say this, that the purpose of speaking in tongues at the initial time that the Spirit of God poured Himself out over people was that those that could not understand the original language could all understand the glory of God in their own language. People were speaking other languages by the gift of the Spirit of God. And so we do know that God gives us a gift of, of tongues and it's for our edification and a, and a communication with God. But we do not understand that again it's for the purpose of revealing Jesus to ourselves but also to others. And so we see the Spirit of God moving miraculously on people being able to speak in different languages uh, and falling under the influence of the Spirit of God declaring the wonders of God aloud. Number three. We see the miracle of discernment. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? We see that the Spirit of God does the miraculous in us and He reveals the intentions and the motives of other people. And so if I am authenticated by God, if I am a messenger of God, uh, if I'm a herald of the glory of God, I'm able to look at men and women by the Spirit of God and discern their motives, discern what's going on behind the scenes under the words that they are speaking. It is a gift. It is a miraculous power that the Spirit of God works in us. Number four, we see for the miracle of healing. Acts chapter 19, 11 and 12 says this, and God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Although the, this, this passage doesn't specifically mention the Spirit of God, we know that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. We see many times through the book of Acts that in the power of the Spirit of God, he healed the sick. And so the, what we see here is that Paul was set aside for the work of God by the Holy Spirit and he was filled. And so the assumption is that through the power of the Spirit of God, God uses Paul to heal men and women. Now, I know that so many of us, when we talk about being filled with the Spirit of God or baptized in the Spirit of God, this is one of the first things we go to is, will we experience the miracle of healing? And friends, that is absolutely a gift from the heavenlies. It's, it comes with the life of Christ, wholeness and healing. But it is just one aspect of what the Spirit of God does amongst us. And so we see these things. And, and then fifthly, so we've seen that the mark of the Spirit, if, we have, if He has been uh, used as a seal over us and, and authenticated us and, and impressioned upon us, it is to reveal Jesus, to transform us to obedience, to proclaim Jesus, to move in power, but also to make manifest the gifts of God. And we read in 1, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 11, uh, is the whole passage. I'm just going to take out a portion. It just says, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Friends, we need to understand that the Spirit of God is given for the glorification of Jesus Christ. And therefore, the Spirit of God is not for selfish a use or personal use only. It is for the common good. God gives us gifts of discernment so that we can protect people or understand things, understand situations, the gift of, of miraculous healing, not so that our name may be, may be glorified, but Jesus' name may be glorified and that someone may turn to Christ and hand their life over to Christ as they see the power of Christ's life in them through healing. So this is what the, the manifestation of the gifts among us is for our strengthening and the maturing of His body, of Jesus Christ's body, the bride. And so this is the work of the Spirit of God. And I can uh, look back to William Booth and read his comment. And, and, uh, and, uh, and he says, The concern that I see is religion without the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine life without these things? Can you imagine life without the proclamation of Jesus Christ? Can you imagine life out without the revelation of Jesus? Can you imagine life without people walking obediently in God, the patterns of God as opposed to patterns of the world? Can you imagine life without the revelation of the, the manifestation of the gifts among us for the strengthening of the body? Can you imagine life without the miraculous taking place of salvation and healing and discernment and words of wisdom? Can you imagine life without that? 
And yet there was something in William Booth that he could see that this was a danger taking place, that people were, were acting outside of the scope of the Spirit of God, possibly seeking their own personal desires and journey. And I think the same thing is true for us today. We believe Jesus for salvation and he says it is finished. But then he says it is better for you. It is better for you, friends, that the Spirit of Christ come to be with us. And God with us at this point in time. And so I do not want to imagine a religion without the Spirit of God. I treasure the Holy Spirit. I treasure the life of Christ. I surrender to Him as one part, one person of the Godhead. He is not in submission to us, but He leads us into truth. And He leads us in the way of life everlasting. And so uh, as we have looked at the mark of the Spirit, how do we know if we are marked by the Spirit? These things will be evident in our lives. And maybe you're sitting there and going, I'm not so sure that these things are evident in my life. I'm not so sure that I'm following Him. And I think there could be two options. One, we're either acting in disobedience, in which case I really urge you to turn your face toward Jesus again to repent of your disobedience and ask the Spirit of God to lead you in truth and the way of life. Or you have not been filled by the Spirit of God. And so we know that the Spirit is given as a seal, uh, as a deposit guaranteeing our future inheritance of salvation and eternity with God. But the Scriptures also talk, as Jesus says, I will send one and He will baptize you. He will come upon you. And so number three, I want to just talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we read in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5, And while staying with them, uh, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. But to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. See, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, but the baptism of the Spirit of God is about the life of Jesus Christ. The Spirit who raised Jesus from death. And so it's the Holy Spirit who gives life. John's baptism, the baptism in water is of repentance and for the forgiveness of our sins. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that we may live a life fully as God intended it to be. Even as we read in John chapter 10, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. And so Jesus was full of the Spirit and he gave of the Spirit. And so we see in the book of Luke, Jesus giving his life. And we see in the book of Acts, Jesus giving of his power. And so Jesus is not just an example for us. He is also the one who empowers us. And so we shouldn't be asking the question, how can we use the power of the Holy Spirit first? We need to be asking, well, how did Jesus use the power of the Holy Spirit? Um, sorry, I didn't uh, keep up to, up to speed with the, the scriptures there. You see, Jesus never, ever cheated. He was fully God and fully man. And the only time we read in the scriptures that he lent into his, definite, his divinity was for the benefit of others. Every time he was tempted in his humanity or tested or opposed, he didn't lean into his divinity. He lent into the spirit of God. And so he gets hungry, he gets tempted, he gets exhausted, and he learned to learn and labored like we labor. And he did this by the power of the Spirit of Christ. See, here's the point. We cannot understand the power of the Holy Spirit apart from the life of Jesus. And Jesus is, after Jesus' baptism, it says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. And he went and lived this empowered life. So as Jesus was empowered by the Spirit, as Scripture is empowered by the Spirit, empowered by the Spirit, as we are empowered by the Spirit to follow Jesus, and we are empowered by the Spirit to be His witnesses. Luke describes this baptism of the Spirit as receiving power for witness in, Luke chapter, in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And so when we receive the Holy Spirit, we will have the power to be the witnesses to the end of the world. That's the immediate description of what's going on. And we will be clothed with power from on high. We read in Luke chapter 24, verses 49. And so the baptism of the Spirit of God, friends, I want to invite you into this moment, is an ongoing occurrence, daily even, where we can cry out for God, the Spirit of Christ, you know, who has already sealed us, who has already marked us, but come upon us freshly for the tasks ahead of us. And this can happen, uh, we see in the scriptures, in one of two ways. 
that Jesus, just by His grace, can pour out the Spirit of God. And so in our prayer time, the Spirit of God can come upon us powerfully. And it can also be the baptism of the Spirit of God by the laying on of hands. I know we're engaging this uh, through a screen, and so I can't physically lay my hands on you, but I can trust that the Spirit of God can come upon you now, baptize you now, that what was once the seal of God as you made a decision of repentance, that you died to yourself and were raised again in new life in Christ, now that you would come under the baptism of the Spirit of God and be empowered to live out these marks of Christ, the mark and the work of the Spirit of God. And so I want to invite you into that now. And so if you would pray with me, I would love to pray with you. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you said that it is better for you to go to be with the Father in order that we may receive the Comforter, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Truth, the one who raised you from the dead and therefore is able to raise us from our dead ways, who is able to empower us, who is able to authenticate us and put his impression upon us that our lives may look increasingly like our Savior's Jesus Christ. And so, Spirit of God, I pray now for everybody that is engaging this in the online world, just that you would come upon them in their bedrooms, in their lounges, in their workspaces, in the car as they're driving. Spirit of God, would you come upon them? Would you, would you empower them to live a life as Jesus lived his life? Empower them, God, for the miraculous. Empower them for witnessing. Empower them for the, re the revealing of Jesus. Empower them for transformation and obedience in following the patterns of God, walking in step with you, Spirit of God, and not in step with the patterns of this world. Would you empower them, God? Fall upon them now. We pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Friends, I often get asked the question, so just where, what is Anthem's theology? What does it look like here? And so I'm going to close this, close, close this message with this. We have the privilege here at Anthem of hearing godly men and women influenced by the Spirit of God proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on a weekly basis in our public meetings. And so the proclamation of Jesus is taking place. That is a mark of the Spirit of God. We have the privilege of witnessing many lives being transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit. There are many of you who are engaging this. They can attest to how your lives have been changed how they've come into revelation and understanding, and how you are no longer the person you once used to be. And so transformation is taking place, a mark of the Spirit of God. We have the privilege of seeing many come to faith in Jesus Christ in our community, and therefore we're seeing the miraculous work of the Spirit of God in salvation, who reveals Jesus' glory to those that He has chosen. We have the privilege of seeing the gifts of hospitality and prophecy and discernment and wisdom and tongues being manifest amongst us, which is a mark, it is a sign, it is an authenticating sign that we are a community that is led by the Spirit of God. We have the privilege of seeing many experience the power of God in healing. We know stories and this healing being of the miraculous type, not through the hands of science and medicine alone. And therefore the Spirit of God is working the, the miraculous healing amongst us. And so what we do believe is that our God is a God of government and order, as we read in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. And so on the evidence of this, Anthem Church is full of the life of this and the work of the Spirit of God, who is welcome and active amongst us. Is the pouring out of the Spirit for all of us? Absolutely. Jesus gives no indication that the outpouring will be for some and not for others. His desire, the work of Jesus, was that all might be redeemed. And the Spirit of God in power continues that work to glorify Jesus and to continue His work. The Spirit wants the whole world to know Jesus and therefore empowers all believers to be Christ's witnesses. The Spirit of God is available to you, wants to work in you to authenticate you as a follower of Jesus, to allow you to stand as a herald 
marked with the King's seal and empowered by the life of Christ through the Spirit of God so that you too may proclaim, reveal and work in the miraculous for the sake of others and the mission of God on this earth. I want to thank you for engaging. Let us not fall into the danger of living out our religion without the Holy Spirit. Bless you, friends.